I'm excited to be here and moderating this important and timely conversation on what the future holds for nuclear power. On the pro side, we have Peter Schwartz. And to those of you who know Peter, he's the co-founder and chairman of Global Business Network, now I believe the largest division within the Monitor Group companies. They do scenario planning for a host of clients, including corporations, governments, the US military and nonprofits, including groups like Google.org. Peter wrote the seminal book on scenario planning, The Art of the Long View. And if you've not read that, I recommend getting it. It's a very uh, cogent uh, discussion even now, many years after its initial release. And he spent five years at Royal Dutch Shell heading up their scenario planning efforts. The argument is actually a very straightforward and very simple one. And it really begins with one very large fact, and it's the fact of climate change. And it's the fact that climate change is not a distant prospect that we should be worried about in 50 or 100 or 200 years, but it's a reality of today. Uh, when we think about risks, you should talk to the people of Pakistan or the citizens of Australia or the citizens of Moscow uh, who all suffered the ravages of climate change in the last year. Thousands of people died this last year because the climate is changing. How many people died in nuclear accidents last year or the year before or the year before or the year before? Every year from now on, people will be dying because of climate change. That's the reality. It is not a distant prospect of gradual global warming, but an increasing frequency of extreme weather events of the sort that we've had in the last year. That is the climate that we are moving into, a world of increasing disruption of human life, of agriculture, and of ecosystems around the world. These weather extremes are the indicator of what is to come. But it will be worse because, of course, today only about 2 billion people in the world are living at a standard of living roughly comparable to what we all enjoy. In the next 20, 30, 40 years, another 4 billion people will want to enjoy the lifestyle that we're enjoying. If they all try to live as we do today, if they all drive that lovely Tesla out there and add to the electricity demand of the world, moving it from gasoline and oil to electricity, we're going to find that literally those four billion people are going to add an enormous amount to the electricity demand of the world. And if we are not to deny them the opportunity that we've all enjoyed, and let me say, I think equity and morality demands that we allow them to, that we don't have the option of saying, no, the gate's closed, we got there, but you don't. Uh, you don't get to play the way we do. There's something fundamentally immoral about that. And oh, by the way, they ain't going to accept it. They aren't going to accept that. They're going to get rich and they're going to drive cars and they're going to have homes and they're going to fly in airplanes. Anybody who's been to China or India lately knows what I'm talking about. There's a ferocity of growth in those places, a ferocity of demand, an energy that is driving those societies that is simply astonishing and will not be stopped no matter what. And energy fuels all of that. And the issue here is one fundamental fact, that the energy that is driving that today is more and more coal, more and more coal. And if we move toward electric vehicles and away from oil and uh, oil powered vehicles, we're going to see even more demand for coal. So it's really all about the coal. And Ralph's colleague Dave Hawkins calculated that if China, India, and the United States go ahead with all the coal plants we are now planning to build over the next 25 to 30 years, we will put into the atmosphere as much CO2 from those three countries as the entire world has done since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That's what we're talking about. And I will tell you, every nuclear plant that does not get built is a coal plant that will be built. Uh, and once you build those coal plants, they're not going to get shut down. They're going to be around for decades and decades to come. And the sooner we build them, the less likely it is that they will have any form of carbon capture or sequestration associated with it. So we will find that more and more and more of the plants here in China and in India and elsewhere around the world, but those three are the big ones, uh, will be built with relatively dirty coal, putting out an enormous amount of CO2. That's the core issue. And as much as I love solar, and as much as I think wind turbines are really cool, I'm, I'm an aeronautical engineer, I'm literally a rocket scientist by education, I think wind turbines are really cool. Having said that, they will not substitute for the coal. We will not close down coal plants to replace them with wind turbines and solar.
uh, for all the obvious reasons which I don't need to go into. And so those 400 million pe four, uh, 4 billion people wanting to get rich, if they all do it with coal, will lead a terrible situation to becoming truly catastrophic. In this week's issue of Science Magazine, for example, there's an article of, about a new piece of research that just came out of NCAR that suggests that if we continue on the path that we are on, we are headed toward not 450 or 550 parts per million of CO2, but in the direction of 1,000. And the momentum of this system worldwide is enormous. And if we get up to those kinds of numbers, what we're looking at is a 31 degree increase centigrade in the average temperature of the Earth, 31 degrees C. That is not survivable for our civilization. That is what is at stake in the end in this choice. If we continue down the road toward more coal to fuel the wealth of the four billion, we are literally going to destroy the planet. We're going to destroy the habitability of the entire Earth. Human civilization will not survive that error. That is the risk of saying no to nuclear power today. Nuclear power has risks, there's no doubt about it. Every technology has risks. But what we have seen in the last decade is that in fact, the options for nuclear power have grown. We have a variety of new technologies uh, that have come along in the last decade or so. Now, the truth is that we in the United States adopted the nuclear power early on with relatively poor technological choices. Over time, the technology options have increased. There are better choices being pursued elsewhere in the world today. We have not started a nuclear plant in the last 30 years, and as a result, our technology is pretty well out of date. But having said that, what we can already see, if you look in Wikipedia, just to take an example, and some of you can probably do that sitting at your laptops, and if you look under micronuclear reactors, you'll find 12 different designs. That is, these are nuclear reactors that range from about 250 megawatts all the way down to 10 megawatts. Uh, small scale, modular plants, some of which can be built in factories, trucked to sites, some of which are already being built that way. The Russians are building 35 megawatt reactors, putting them on barges and taking them up to the Arctic even as we speak. The the country of Singapore is considering building an island and, put, and put, putting a small scale reactor offshore. So what we're looking at around the world is an interest in nuclear reactors of all scales, not just simply the mega scales that we've been used to in the past. For example, at Lawrence Livermore Lab, the Hyperion reactor is a 10 megawatt reactor about the size of a refrigerator. Uh, when you're done with it, you bury it and cover it up and forget it. Uh, now, my point is very simple, that the options are increasing because the demand is increasing. We need the options, and we now have about a dozen different runners in micro-reactors beginning to come along. At the high end, we've got two or three other designs, the AP-1000 and several others that are beginning to be developed. The point is that as a result, what we've got is a variety of choices. We're not locked into one single nuclear technology. We have competing, competing technologies that all offer options. We in the United States, unfortunately, are not moving very aggressively as the rest of the world is. The one other option I might mention, which is a surprise and I would not have included in the past, but I think is now increasingly plausible, is new fusion technology. Now, many of you will be familiar with the, uh, the magnetic bottle that is being built in Europe. I think it's unlikely to work. I think the physics of it doesn't work. But at Le Livermore Labs, we've got the giant new National Ignition Facility, which is a giant laser, actually about 128 lasers coming in on a beam and uh, uh, producing fusion in a small deuterium capsule. They expect to hit sustained fusion next year. Uh, if they succeed, they think they will have a commercial reactor in 10 years, i.e. 2020. Now, let me say that the odds of success here, let me call it one in 10. It's still pretty low. The engineering of this is unbelievably difficult. But having said that, if it happens, it's a real breakthrough and it's a game-changing technology. Deuterium is abundant and relatively cheap and can produce abundant electricity using laser fusion. I'm not counting on that. What I am saying is that we need to pursue all of those options. All of them need to be pursued because we don't have any luxury, we don't have any time to waste, we don't have any maneuvering room, and we cannot achieve the levels of CO2 reduction necessary to slow the climate change that is already underway. Because the climate change is happening, it isn't a question of weather, it's only a question of how much. And if we go ahead without nuclear power, if you look at the way in which the renewables are being deployed today and being operated today, and even in any system that one can imagine in the near future, it is unlikely to be able to produce the volume of electricity that we are going to need in addition to what is coming with the growth in population and the growth in demand from things like electric vehicles. So unless we are prepared 
to see the kind of weather events that we've seen in the last year continue and to increase in their intensity, increase in their frequency, and increase in their impacts around the world, causing vast human suffering, starvation, and death in enormous numbers, we need nuclear power. Thank you. In your one minute summary, yeah. Peter. Ralph, you know, look, I think this is in the end a question of moral judgment. Can we take the risk with the lives and fate of not only our children, but the children of all the peoples of the world, to say no to a technological option that radically reduces carbon dioxide. We know very clearly what the consequences of going ahead with the current pattern of development here and around the world is likely to be. If we build all those coal plants that we're now planning to build around the United States and in China and in India, we are going to find a world that we do not like very much. It will not be a question of economic choice. It will be a question of war and peace. It will be a fight over water. It will be a fight over air. It will be a fight over land. It will be a fight over food. This is a question of war and peace. It is not a question of economics. And if we fail to deter the rise of CO2 in a radical way, radically reduce that CO2, uh, CO2 emissions, we will find ourselves in a world of conflict, in a world of disorder, and a world that our children will curse us for. And if we make the choices today right to give ourselves choices in the future, if we have options in energy, in a decade, in 20 years' time. If we can do it without CO2, we're going to create a world for our children where they have choices, they have room to maneuver, and they can make still better choices beyond that.